I know for some of you, five minutes is just getting you warmed up. <laughs> and by the way, if you didn't get a flower yet, ladies, these are not the leftover flowers. We didn't mean to imply that. Like if you didn't get one yet, well, all we have left is the leftover flowers. They're just like stems with no flower on it. We actually have, uh, you know, new flowers for you. So Rick, Rick's wandering around with his bucket of flowers, and he will be happy to pass one on to you. So uh, before we get going, I wanted, let's see, Zach, why don't you come up here? I don't know where I put my microphone. Here we go. Just give us a quick rendition of uh, last weekend. Yeah. So last Sunday, uh, you know, towards the end of the service, uh, John kind of opened up a space for prayer. Um, and Lydia, I don't think she's here today, she came up and said that she had a word that someone here was experiencing lower back pain and uh, pain in the right shoulder. Um, so my buddy Jared actually went up, got prayed over. Uh, he recently got his fishing license. He thought he would be like Tarzan. He saw a little uh, vine and tried swinging on it. Well, that ended up with him landing on his back on a rock. So he had a, a lot of pain. Um, so Lydia prayed over him, you know, sitting up front. He uh, came and walked by me. And I asked him, I'm like, how's the back doing? You know, are you in any pain? He said he felt God doing something, but there was still pain there. So I'm like, okay, on a scale of one to 10, where's the pain at? He said, I woke up this morning, it was like a seven to eight. Um, after she prayed, it's not like a six. I said, all right, well, can I pray for you? Um, so I prayed over him. Uh, you know, I'm like, hey, do me a favor, test it out. So we kind of started moving around a little bit. His eyes start getting big. He goes, it's at a three. I'm like, that's awesome, let's pray again. Prayed over him again, um, same thing, you know, test it out, we started moving. He goes, Zach, it's at a one. I'm like, praise God, you know, I'm like, well, I was like, we're about to pray this pain down to a zero. Where this confidence came from, I have no idea, but I'm like, <laughs> we're about to pray this to a zero. Uh, so I prayed over him again. Um, you know, we started moving. He goes, Zach, there's no pain. Um, you know, when I talked to him earlier uh, last week, and yeah, he said there's still no pain at all. Um, so praise God for that. <laughs> so that was Sunday, okay? Then the following day, Monday, uh, I was at work. My wife, she was actually out helping uh, one of her coworkers move a bunch of stuff in her house. Um, so I'm at work, she calls me and she was like, Zach, I don't know if I pinched a nerve or what's going on, but I'm experiencing really bad back pain. Um, and I was like, okay, you know, so I get home from work and she's, I mean, she could hardly walk. I mean, she's literally walking like this and you know, she's in just absolute tears. So we went, got the boys to bed. Um, and then afterwards I went and like laid in bed with her and I just invited the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, just come Holy Spirit, waited a minute, and then just started praying over her back. And then we just sat there for about five minutes. Well, then she, uh, she was like, Zach, I need to use the restroom. So I'm like, all right. So she gets up. Now, mind you, anytime she was sitting down, standing up, I mean, she's literally wincing. I mean, there's just absolute pain all over her face. She was scared, you know, and she was literally just sitting there in tears. So after I prayed for her, she uh, gets up, and she starts walking a little bit, and she starts shaking her hands. And I was like, what are you doing? She goes, I'm praising God. And I was like, what? And I kid you not, she started bending over, touching her toes, going like this. I mean, I mean, literally just seeing from like her just in absolute tears, walking like this, to being able to just bend over. I mean, it was just amazing. So, yeah, praise God. Sweet. Cool. <laughs> I remember the... Uh, the story John Weber told back in the day when they were first going on this adventure of healing. And he said he'd prayed for someone after uh, almost 10 months of praying for people constantly and nobody getting better. And, and oftentimes people getting worse while they were praying for them. Them getting sick, like they'd catch people's colds. And he said they, he prayed for this lady and she got healed. And he, and he said he, was, he walked out of her house like, he was just like, did that really happen? And he's standing in the yard and he goes, we got one! <laughs> we got one! <laughs> and that was, that started something. And uh, there's something about faith that comes, it gets quickened in your own heart when you hear what God does for somebody else. And, and it doesn't have to necessarily just be about healing. It could be about God uh, giving someone guidance in a moment that they really needed it. 
or someone experiencing forgiveness. They're just carrying this terrible burden of guilt around and they, they go to Jesus and he forgives them and they experience this joy and these, this weight off of their shoulders and they tell other people, when you hear a story, something comes with that story that's like a taste of the grace that the person experienced. That I don't know any other way to share. That's why Jesus constantly told people, and you're going to see in the story we hear today, when God's done something for you, tell other people about it. Because it sparks something in them. They go, wow, God, God's real. He, he, he seems to be real. For them, could he be real to me? And, it, and oftentimes, there's something about the faith that you expressed when you reached out and tried to trust God in some way that it just sparked something in other people. So today, uh, I want to remind you, some of you have seen this, this video on the internet. Um, it's a video where it, the video starts with, with these 10 people standing in a line, and uh, there's different versions of it, but there's, and everyone's dressed in sort of athletic gym gear, and uh, there's one group of five and another group of five, and they each have a basketball. And one's dressed in you know, red, and one's dressed in white, and what the, uh, a voice comes over, and then a caption says, we want you to count how many times the team in white passes the ball. Have you seen that before? Some of you, a few? Okay, don't tell anybody what's going on yet, okay. And so then uh, the, the, they just, they, they break up and they're running around and they're tossing the ball and there's two teams tossing the ball in it. And, you know, you're looking at it and you're going, oh, okay, white to white, white to white, white. Okay, and then, and then they stop and, and you go, okay. I remember watching, I said, I think it's 13 to myself. And then said, if you said it's 13, you were right. Yes, I knew I could get it. And then they said, uh, but while you were watching the people throw the ball, did you see anything else? And I'm thinking, no, I saw 10 people throwing two balls. And they go, if you only saw 10 people throwing two balls, you missed something else. And I'm thinking, how could I miss anything? This, it was the simplest scene you could imagine. So they, the, the thing goes, and they rewind it. And then they start throwing the ball again. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of the people comes this moonwalking gorilla. <laughs> just, whoop, just dancing. Whoop. He's dancing around. You know, he's doing this. <laughs> and then he disappears. And I'm going, no, that was not the same scene I saw. This is like a, another scene. They're just trying to spoof you, right? So I rewind the YouTube thing and start. And sure enough, there it was. The moonwalking gorilla was right there. I, it could have been moonwalking Godzilla. I wouldn't have seen it because I was looking for, right? They told me what to look for. And, of course, good, obedient southern boy, that's exactly what I look for. Anybody else see the gorilla the first time you saw it? One person, a rare person. Kieran saw the gorilla. So, uh, Kieran has ADD, too, so just want you to know. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we sometimes, like, okay, so I missed the gorilla, so what? Okay, it's a funny story. The Bible there gives, I want to show you two cautionary tales that are back-to-back -back in the Gospel of Mark that show us that we don't want to miss things that God brings to us. And I want to show you the story. There's two stories here where uh, two, let's see, uh, two people, two groups of people encountered Jesus and they didn't really see who he really was. And because of that, they just didn't really respond to him meaningfully. And so they missed both of them missed opportunities, and both those stories are in there. They're in Matthew, they're in Mark, and they're in Luke, and I think one of them is in John. Uh, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke record these stories back to back, and you're going to see why when we read it. So if you have a, a Bible with you, turn it to Luke chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, towards the end of the chapter. We're going to look at verse 35. And I'm just going to read the first story 
Then we're going to stop for a second, and then I'm going to go to the second story, okay? So let's pray. Uh, Lord, we want to see you as you really are, and not just the way we've been trained to see you. We want to see you as great as you are. We ask today, Lord, that you would take blinders, any blinders that are on our eyes that hinder us from seeing you, any lenses, any unbelief, any skepticism, wherever it comes from. We just ask for your help as we hear your word today to be able to see you and then to be able to respond to you properly. We thank you for the opportunity that we have and opportunities that are going to present themselves in the future. We want to be prepared for them. So we pray your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and that, Jesus, we could see you clearly in it today. And, Father, we ask that in in your son's name. Amen. Okay, verse 4, verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they uh, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall or storm came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So a sudden storm breaks. And now this is in the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is this large lake. They call it a sea. It's not really a sea in the strictest sense, but it's pretty good size. At the widest point, it's about eight miles across, and it's about 12 miles long. And a lot of the scenes that we read in the Gospels happened around that lake, literally on the lake, like you heard of Capernaum, you heard, hear Gad, we're going to hear in a second, Gadara, uh, and, and around it. That, that part of Israel it was in Galilee, and that's where Jesus spent the most time. And so the sudden storm, and, and another thing about this is on this lake, uh, all around the lake, it's, it's, it's below sea level, if, if you didn't know that. Uh, it's below sea level, and the cliffs on either side go from like 1,400 feet to 2,500 feet. And so the, it's a unique kind of a geographical space, and what people have said, for some reason, the wind will blow from the east, and as it uh, blows across those, those mountains, all of a sudden it just drops off these cliffs that are along the, uh, the east side of the lake. And it can cause these storms, these, these uh, storms that just descend on the lake, boom, like that, just out of nowhere. It isn't like you need cl- you know, rain and storms, the typical kind of way we experience storms. These these are not storms with lightning and rain. They're, they're just wind storms. Now, they do have lightning and rain storms, but that's not what they're talking about here. And it's not a real deep lake. At the deepest part, it's about 200 feet. But mostly, it's way shallower. And uh, scientists have gone through that lake and looked at the bottom of it, because that's what they do, and they found hundreds of boats because they sank on this lake over, over the centuries. These storms are dangerous. And so Jesus and the disciples are, are going across this from the northern part of the lake. They're going over to the east side of the lake where this wind especially is and the storms break out. And so this storm breaks out. And of course, some of the people in the boat are fishermen, some aren't. But everybody freaks out. And I thought it was interesting. It says that there are other boats with them. And I'm thinking, I wonder what happened to those other boats. Anybody else see that? And I thought, gosh, you know, I hope those guys made it. Uh, but in this boat, Jesus 
is asleep. His disciples come over and shake him. And they say, hey, don't you care about us? And he goes, no, that's why I've been sleeping. No, he didn't say that. Uh, he said, I got a cushion. I'm not going to drown. You know, you guys are all going to drown. Uh, he, he gets up and, you know, here's the storm. And he just speaks, stop it, be quiet. And it went, Phew. all right, just like that. And his disciples go, who is this? Now, this is, this is probably at least a year into them spending 24 hours a day, seven days a week with him. They've seen everything you can think of. And I think they thought they had him figured out. They'd seen him do all kinds of healing miracles, right? At this point, he's raised the dead. He's taught thousands of people. But they'd never seen anything like this before. And this is one of those things where, like I've had some of you say, I've just never seen an answered prayer like that before. Or not just like this, but any kind. Like even what Zach was describing a couple of minutes ago. Just to see someone who's in, oh. And some of you know, you, when, you get, when your back gets in that place and you're walking around, you know, like just sitting up is like being stabbed with a knife. And to have the pain just leave to the point where you can move and bend and, you know, like Zach was doing, you can do a little. I don't know if you noticed, but Zach did that a couple of times. And Zach, you're a married man. I just hope you, it was awkward. And you know, when your back's hurting, you can't do that, can you? You don't even want to think about doing that. Some of you are going, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> After Zach and John trying to do that, it's like it's lost all its cachet completely. <laughs> I think those disciples thought, okay, Jesus is a prophet. Like, he's really, like, this is amazing. And then suddenly, whatever level Jesus had gotten to in their thinking, which was already above everything they'd ever experienced, Jesus went to a new floor. Right? He went to the penthouse. He went to a place that they didn't even have an explanation for. They just said, who is this? That even nature. Now, you're seeing a picture of something that's uncontrollable. The next story, we're going to see another situation of something that was dangerous and uncontrollable. And we see this picture here where this is incredibly dangerous. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus challenges them at the very end of this. Do you remember that part? And he says, where's your faith? And you're thinking, probably, charitably, well, I don't know if I was in that situation. I wouldn't have any faith either. Gosh, Jesus is, he's a hard dude to please. I don't think so. I think Jesus is easy to please. I think, just like us, we have this barrier in our minds. They had it. We have it. We have it. We, I think that barrier is there, and it keeps us in our faith from only going so far. We look at a situation like praying for someone's back, and we go, you know, like the barrier is about 20 feet in front of that and go, no, 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 that's okay. I got, there's, yeah, I can go there, right? You keep going and, the, and the, you know, the challenges get bigger. At some point, they get to the storm and that's where the barrier is and you go, that's it. My faith cannot go any further than that. But God wants our faith to go further than that because he was saying to them, in essence, why did you wake me up? You could have done what I did. You could have said in my name what I did. That's what you're learning to do. You are my disciples. You are my apprentices. Sometimes when we think of the term disciple, I don't know if we know what that means, but it just means to be someone's apprentice. And rabbis, and Jesus was a rabbi, he followed this, the, the traditional rabbinical model where he would, they, disciples would come 
and be trained by a rabbi. And at a certain point, the rabbi would re- recognize that they were mature enough and skilled enough and you know, they, they, they matched his quality of character and understanding. And then they would release him to go and begin to train students themselves because Israel was growing and they needed more instruction. But the essence of what it was to follow the rabbi It wasn't just learning a bunch of material. You were embracing their lifestyle. The goal was every rabbi wanted you to be just like them. You go back to Genesis 1, it says that God was the original rabbi. And he made Adam and Eve, and he said, follow me, I want you to be just like me. And he gave them authority, he said, rule over. What did he say rule over? Just stop for a second and think about this. He said rule over the the whole earth. Storms included. From the very beginning. And then when we, in Adam and Eve, went our own way, our authority was transferred because to the one that we followed and began to imitate humanity had a new rabbi and we began to follow that rabbi and we let we released we let go of that rabbi stole our authority then jesus came and he did what we didn't do he obeyed the father at every point no matter what it cost him and when the devil tempted him he just said no no way And then he called people to himself because he's creating a new humanity. And he's asking people to choose which humanity do you want to be a part of. And so all these people are following him, but they don't realize they're really called to do everything he did. Now, you may listen to this and go, I don't know. You know, John, I like the kind of thing that Zach was talking about, but you're talking about nature miracles, right? That just sounds way too out there. Well, all throughout the history of the church, Christians have done nature miracles, whether you know it or not. And a lot of our churches don't like to talk about it because it doesn't fit in with our theological framework, which says that God doesn't do those things anymore. And one of the things that, you know, a lot of churches around the world have have tried to stand for is everything in this book needs to be believed and obeyed. And John Wimber used to say to people, uh, when, you, when God began to use you to, t- to do all these amazing things and teach other people to do what you were doing, where'd you get that from? Like, did an angel show up to you? And, you know, did God appear? Did Jesus appear to you? Did some great preacher or healer lay his hands on you? And he said, no, I was just teaching through the book of Luke, and I was skipping all the miracle stories. Because I I was taught that that stuff doesn't happen. And God began to say to me, stop teaching your experience. Teach my word. And so he said, I believe. And he was also uh, an adjunct professor at a local seminary, Fuller Seminary. And he was meeting all these Pentecostal uh, missionaries and leaders who saw all these things happen on the mission field. But they couldn't talk about him when they came back to the United States to their churches because their churches didn't believe in this stuff and they stopped giving them money to do missions. And so Wimber said they were actually praying for people. So we would read this book. He says, we're teaching through the book of Luke verse by verse. And every time there was a sick person and Jesus prayed for him, we stopped and we said, who's sick here? We're going to pray for you. And that started that almost a year long painful experience of praying for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people because their church was growing but no prayers for the supernatural were happening at all until this one person got healed that I mentioned earlier when we uh, I'll give you two stories about nature miracles one was uh, years ago there was a, a famous Christian leader in China named uh, Watchman Nee. Anybody heard of Watchman Nee? Has he read books? Yeah, a bunch of you. He's a very famous Christian leader. Uh, 
He lived during World War II, and then when the communists took over in 1949, he was in prison, and he was killed, died in prison. Uh, and I, was, I, I have his biography, one of his biographies, uh, I think it's called Against the Tide. And they tell a story of how when Watchman he was a young leader, uh, he, and, he took a team of six other young men, and they went to an island and, because they wanted to share the gospel there. But when they got there and they started sharing the gospel, it was this period of time in the island's calendar where they had this spring festival. And everybody was celebrating, and everybody was, you know, doing all the stuff that you do and partying. It's kind of like uh, being, if you go to New Orleans uh, during Mardi Gras. It's just crazy, you know. We used to go down there during Mardi Gras and share the gospel. And let me tell you, people are distracted. <laughs> and so that's, yeah, and, and, and it was even before they, it got as crazy as it is now. So they're, they're trying to share the gospel, and they're saying, why aren't you guys listening to us? We're telling you good news about Jesus. And they go, Jesus, you know, we don't believe in your God. Our God is a Wu-Tang, or a Wa-Tang. It wasn't Wu-Tang, the band. I'm sorry. It was Ta-Wang. Sorry. Wu-Tang is in my head. I apologize. Pastors aren't supposed to think about that, but I used to listen to Wu-Tang Clan. Okay. Ta-Wang, their God, was the God who protected their island, who provided for them, helped their women to, to deliver babies healthy. You know, they had good... Uh, 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 crops and, and their fishermen, you know, brought plenty of fish back. And so they all worshiped him. And at the, in the middle of this festival, for 286 years, they would have a special day where they would honor Tawang. And so uh, the, one of the young missionaries, not Watchman Nee, one of the young missionaries with him, the young leaders said, uh, well, Tawang is not a real god. He's, he's an idol. He's an inferior god, he's, if he's even real at all. And they go, no, you, you know, they, and they, they got in this argument. And so this young man said, so you'll know that Tawang is a false god. And because they told him the, the history for 286 years, every time they celebrate his day, uh, earlier in the year, they would pick by divination, a day, they would go to the, you know, to the, uh, uh, to, to the temple, and they would, the, the priest would pray, and they would set a date, and for 286 years, it never rained on that day. And it was a sign that they were worshiping Tawang, the, the, you know, the true God that they were supposed to worship. And so this young man said, Jesus is the one that you're supposed to serve, and so you will know that he's the real God that you should serve and not Tawang, it's going to rain and flood on the day that you've set for that. Now, this was like four days ahead. And, you know, this is, this is, a, this is on an island in the Pacific Ocean. And so, you know, it wasn't like it never rained there. But for 286 years, it never rained on that day. And so Watchman Nee was in another part of the village preaching, and he heard this story because everyone started talking about it, and the word spread through the village. Oh, the Christians are saying yada, yada, yada. And everyone was just all excited about it. And Watchman Nee wasn't excited at all. He said, oh, no. You know, we're going to have to leave the island. This is, this is terrible. And he got together. They all got together. And he, like, he chewed out this young guy. He said, what are you doing? And, and the young guy said, I just felt like I should say that. And, and he said, well, we've got to pray. They started praying. And all of them heard this phrase. This is the phrase they all heard as they prayed silently. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? That's what came into their minds. And, they, and Washington Nee knew exactly what that meant. You know, it was about a dramatic encounter between the, uh, the, the priests of, of Baal and, and Elijah. And so he went, wow, maybe, maybe there's something here. We should pray. <laughs> And so they prayed for day after day, and it was just sunny, right? They'd go to the beach and look out. There's no clouds. There's nothing. They wake up 7 o'clock the morning on the 11th of whatever month it was, and they, they go outside and they look up, and there's just no clouds at all, and they have breakfast. It's like 7 in the morning, and they're sitting there, and they pray and thank God for their breakfast, and, and they start eating a bowl of rice, and they hear this on the tin roof.
you know, and you know, they go and look outside, and it's just a thunderstorm. From a completely clear sky, storms just rush in, rains, and he said in about 10 minutes, the, the water, you know, because these villages are built on not nice, flat, engineered land like we have. They're built on uneven surfaces, and the streets are just flooding. He said, you can't even step off the steps of their hut. If you do, you're going to be in trouble. And he said, uh, they, they go out to the edge of, of their little patio, and they're looking, and they see the, uh, the priest carrying the, the, the little, like they, they all had like a little platform that they put the uh, Tawang uh, idol on, and they're carrying him uh, along. It's just raining like as hard as you can imagine. And the water's rushing down the street, and it's like up to their legs, and they're holding Tawang above the water, and they're trying to walk. At a certain point, you know, the, like some current hits them, and they all fall over, and Tawang falls, and his arm breaks off, and his ear, and, you know, and they're all freaking out. Uh, because they, they, they have, you know, great reverence for this God. They don't want to get him upset, so they grab the God, and they get him back on there, and they get up somewhere, and they try to, you know, repair their God and start again. Anyway, it goes really bad. And so everyone gets, and, and it rains all the way through to the end of the day. Then all the priests get together, and they say, oh, we had the date wrong. We, we miscalculated. It's, it's really the 14th. It's three more days. Well, the rain just goes away. And so, <laughs> watch him, and he says, we're a little more confident at this point now. <laughs> and so they said, uh, they went out to the crowd and gathered everybody together, and they said, here's what's going to happen. It's not going to rain for the next three days, but it's going to rain again on the 14th. So you will know Tawang is not the true God. And so then they had three nervous days. Because even though they, you know, God showed them some encouragement, they just were like, oh, this, you know, is this really real? Sure enough, the festival came, but the rain didn't start till like the festival was in full swing, and then it just ruined the party, right? Everybody was out there, the picnic tables were set, everybody's boogieing around, <laughs> and boom, the rain ruins the picnic. You didn't even need ants this time. The ants were carried away if they were there. And, uh, and, and at a certain point in the afternoon, they just lifted. And so all of this little team of evangelists just spread out through the village. And this revival broke out. And everyone took all their little idols that they had and burned them. And, and the church there just flourished for you know, decades and decades and decades. We are called as image bearers of God, to have authority over even nature. I've seen this happen myself. I'll tell you one more story. We were down in Brazil, and our church in the Marysville Vineyard had helped plant a church in Macapá, which is on the mouth of the Amazon. And we, uh, one of the pastors of Marysville Vineyard and I traveled down there, and there was, uh, we'd been down there a couple of times before. We went down to speak at a retreat, and they had like 50 or 60 people at the retreat, and it was way out, away from the, the city, and we took several vans to get there, and it was really a nice place. It's real warm and pretty, and, and we weren't very far from the Amazon, and uh, one day, probably the third day, uh, and I wish Tony Farr was here. He could tell you the story, too. Tony, some of you, how many you know Tony Farr? Okay, some of us here. Tony was there with me. He saw this too. See, uh, uh, all the stuff that happened. Uh, I have some pictures somewhere in my house of, of some of what I'm going to describe to you. We finished the session. We were just sitting there, and uh, it's raining really hard. And uh, it's, it's, it was one of those roofs that's just real loud, and we had to kind of stop teaching because it was raining so hard because you just couldn't hear anything. And so everybody's sitting around the outside of the building. Uh, there's like a big porch. It's a big wide porch because when it rains, you know, you, it just gets muggy inside a building. And so everyone sits outside. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm inside because everybody's outside and it's not so oppressive when everyone isn't pressing in on you. And it sounds like a train. Just this roar starts. And I walk over to, the, to one of the entrances towards where the sound is. 
And, I'm and everyone in the place is rushing over to that side of the building. And, and they're all underneath the, this, this roof eave. And I'm looking, and, and the Amazon River is like just on the other side of Avery Road. So if you can imagine right there, maybe a little bit further out in that field. But there's big trees. You know, when you're along the mouth of the Amazon, there's just, it's just forests. And I'm looking, and I hear this sound, and it's raining. And all of a sudden, I look, and I go, that's a tornado. And I'm looking. I walk out a little closer. And I'm taller than everybody, so I'm going. And I'm looking at Buck, who's our missionary there. And I go, what is that? And he goes, that's a tornado. And he goes, tornadoes don't happen around here. They just don't in that part of, of uh, Brazil, in that part of the Amazon. So I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, wow, this is really interesting. I've never, like, I've seen them way off, but this is, like, close. This is, like, maybe three, 400 yards. And then we're all standing there and realizing this thing's moving towards us. And trees are, like, it's, it's kind of like a lawnmower. You know when you have your lawnmower, you don't have the little cover on it, how it's throwing the grass out? Well, it's throwing grass on both sides, but it's throwing trees, like trees taller than this building. And I'm looking, and it's just, it's not moving real fast, but it's definitely moving this way. And I'm looking. And then all of a sudden, it gets to about on the other side of the Avery Road, which isn't very far from here. And people, we're all standing there like that, and people start going like this. <laughs> Everyone's starting to back up, right? And all of a sudden, there's a wall. You can't back up any further. And people are moving along the wall, and they're like going inside the building. And Buck and I are standing there. And it's kind of like one of these Three Stooges things. You ever seen the old Three Stooges? They're all lined up, and the captain says, we need a volunteer for a suicide mission. You know, and everyone goes, and everyone goes like this. Step back, and there's one guy standing there. And the captain goes, congratulations, son. You're so brave. You know, and he's going, what, what are you talking about? Everyone step back, and it's me and Buck. And we're right at the edge. The water's just pouring down here. You know, and I'm looking. And it got to maybe the edge of the parking lot. And I'm thinking, you know, there's nowhere to hide. I, I, really, I just was frozen. Buck is standing there, just like this young guy. Here, I'm the, I'm the pastor, right, sending the missionary out. Buck just steps out into the rain like this and puts his hands out like this and says, in Jesus' name, he yells it, go away. And this twister stopped and then moved that way and then went around the edge of the building and then went like that and then just kept going. And we have pictures of the, the path where everything's cut away. And it was about like, where the, the, the car, where the parking lot starts here, or like, it was like someone mowed around the building and all the bushes and trees and everything, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, and then just went on. And the newspaper came and, you know, a helicopter flew over because the town's like 20 miles away. Everyone had heard about this crazy thing, just that, that there'd been a twister. And so they were interviewing everyone that saw it. And so all these people were telling them about Buck Everyone's estimation of Buck w went up dramatically. <laughs> and it did for me. I'm looking at him thinking, man, Buck, Buck's got all kinds of character issues, right? <laughs> but, Buck, but Buck had some pretty radical faith. He said, I don't know. It just seemed like that's what I should do. And I said, and the hands and stuff and the yelling. And he said, I don't know. It just popped into my head. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Gosh, I must not be listening to the Lord. It didn't pop into my head. <laughs> All that popped into my head is, you know, I hope my life insurance is paid up. <laughs> uh, I, I hope my wife and children know I love them. This is, this is not a crazy, you know, outlier thing. This happens way more frequently than you think. And it's happened throughout history. Credible witnesses have, have seen, and I, I don't know if you think I'm a credible witness. I watched it happen, and I still have a hard time believing it happened. Can I share a couple stories? A short one? Go. Come up here. Okay. Hit the button. Test. Um, so first, real quick one. I, I had known about 
what was going on with Zach. Um, so I, on Thursday, I said, Zach, I want you to pray for my knee before you leave. Um, so, and the, the Saturday before I've been playing pickleball and a couple years ago I ran this 15K and my right knee has never been the same since. Um, so when I was playing pickleball the previous weekend, I was kind of limping around and it was hurting and I asked Zach to pray for me. I immediately felt the Holy Spirit when he started praying, um, which these days it feels like joy, which is wonderful. But anyway, I played pickleball on Saturday. It didn't bother me. I forgot that I had the knee problem until I played pickleball for like an hour and then going, oh, my knee didn't hurt. So I'm keeping an eye on it, but I'm really encouraged so far. So if you, if you need some, go, Zach has it right now. So. <laughs> um, and then on the, the nature thing, when I, I was on this island um, doing an au pair long ago in 2009, and there's this, there's this little Catholic church that... Um, you know, a few decades ago, they, they have this volcano that erupts all the time. Um, and so one day it erupted, and this giant wall of lava came rolling down the mountain, destroyed the police station, you know, like rolled over the road, and it was coming towards this church. And I don't know exactly what the story is, but basically you can go look at it. The lava stops with like this much room in front of the front door, and there's this little walk pathway that's about this narrow you can barely fit in it and the lava flows down on either side of this little catholic church this wall of, it's this high a wall of lava and that's where it decided to stop and flow down on either side of this little church yeah it's amazing yeah thank you there's probably some little nun in that church <laughs> doing that, right? Uh, what? I, I'm not going to tell you the other story. I'm just going to give you a quick summary of it because I, I just want you to take away a point and then we want to pray. The next story is where Jesus, um, the, it, it, the trip he's heading on where they have the storm that, that, that temporarily interrupts it, he arrives across uh, the other side of the Sea of Galilee to an area that's pretty much a Gentile area. And there's a, a, a famous citizen of the area who is uh, like a, a maniac. And he lives near the graveyard. And he basically just, the, the, the history of it is he just terrorized the whole area because uh, he was uh, so strong that they couldn't tie him up even with shackles and chains. He would just break them. And he would just rant and rave, and it's like if you've ever been in, in a large city, or you've ever been in other countries, and you've ever seen some people, some street people that, are, that act like that, uh, they're all over the place. You know, if you go to, like, go to New York, you will run into it on the subway. And so this man, uh, they, they didn't even have a name for him. He, the, the, uh, Mark tells the story that uh, for years, no, this, this was like a solution, a problem with no solution. And so Jesus gets off the boat, walks on the land, and this man, again, this deadly, malevolent, uncontrollable force, runs up to Jesus, looks like he's going to attack Jesus, and he falls on his knees before Jesus. Now, again, this is the way the story is told, okay? Jesus stills the storm, then boom, he encounters this man, this uncontrollable, deadly force. Jesus isn't doing anything, but just sort of standing there. And the man falls on his feet and starts ranting and says, you know, uh, leave me alone. And Jesus immediately sees, oh, this is a demonic situation. These are demons. This is at least one demon. He begins to tell the demon to leave. And they have this dialogue. And, and in this dialogue that Jesus has with this man, the man, uh, when Jesus says to the man, what's your name? The man says, my name's Legion, because there's many. And so it's the demon speaking, because there's many of us. And a legion of Roman soldiers was four or 5,000. No one really knows exactly, because there isn't any record anywhere of exactly how many were in a legion, but there were thousands. So he's saying, I've got, it's me and a lot of friends in here. And Jesus is, is telling them to leave. And it says, you have to read it. Uh, I, you know, I don't read Greek, but I, I know enough 
how to look this up. If you, if you read the language carefully, it says that Jesus had been telling this spirit to leave, and it wasn't leaving. And so Jesus has this dialogue, take it a little further. And then in Jesus, because when you get involved in deliverance, it isn't always like this. And sometimes it can be a wrestling match, like Paul says, for quite a while before you get the spirits out. So Jesus, who just commanded the wind and the waves to stop, and it stops, there's resistance here. Well, eventually, the, the, the spirits say, don't make us leave the area, which is a theme in this passage, a, a, an interesting theme. They begged him, please don't make us leave this area. And Jesus says, okay. And they said, send us into the pigs. And there's a herd of pigs nearby. It says 2,000 pigs. And he said, okay, you can go into them. And they all, the, the, it says the spirits leave the man. And if you've ever seen a deliverance, there, it's clear when spirits leave people. And they leave the man, and they go into this herd of pigs. And then the herd of pigs, remember I told you about how there's cliffs all around the Sea of Galilee? They rush over to a cliff and fall into the lake. Now, people will tell you, I have friends, uh, one of my good friends you know, grew up on a hog farm. Hogs can swim. They're not like some of us. <laughs> Sorry, I, didn't, I just took a shot there. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, they can swim, but they drown. And all of a sudden, it says... The word spread to the town. Everyone runs there to see what's going on. And it says the first thing they see is this man who has terrorized the region, sitting, clothed, and normal. It says in his right mind. And the people look at him and hear all that happened. And they said, oh, yay, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, we're going to come build a church for you. You know, we want you. We, we love you. Thank you so much for, you know, like changing our lives because we couldn't walk near parts of town, so to speak. Did they say that? No. What did they say? It says they begged him to leave. So the demons begged Jesus not to throw them out of the region. Then when Jesus cast the demons into the hogs and the hogs were drowned, or the pigs were drowned, the people came and they begged him. There's three times where people beg in this story. They begged Jesus to leave. So it says, Jesus went over and he got in the boat. Does that surprise you that he just said, okay, I'll leave? And as he's getting in the boat, the man says, can I follow you? It says, he begged Jesus to follow him. And Jesus said, no, you can't follow me. But what, he commissioned him. I want you to go back into this community, which was one of the 10 cities. They call it the Decapolis. The city that these people were from was part of this collection of uh, Roman and Greek cities. And he says, I want you to go and like, be an apostle and tell them what the Lord's done for you. And it says when he went and did that, everyone was amazed. Just like it says when Jesus taught and healed and delivered and did things. People were amazed. It's the same word. This man's story amazed them. You see the power of, of this testimony? And so here's, here's the two things I want you to just go home with. Number one, we have to press through this barrier that says we're not supposed to do what Jesus did. It is an it's a doctrine of demons. It's not just a bad teaching. It is a doctrine of demons. And if you believe it, you have to repent of it. Because there's no other way. The, the interesting thing about these two stories is when Jesus said to the wind and the waves, stop it, he used the same language he used in all the deliverance experiences. Stop it. And most scholars say it's clear that Mark is implying that this windstorm was a demonically driven storm to try to destroy Jesus and his disciples, and, or at least to keep them from going to, to where they were going. It's like the spirits knew trouble's coming our way. 
And they had this authority. Now, here's the, here's the, the takeaway about what Jesus said to, these, to this man. The people begged Jesus to leave. Jesus brought the kingdom of God. He brought the promises of God. He brought hope. He brought every good thing. Wherever he showed up, nothing bad happened. Except, you could look at 2,000 hogs drowning as a bad thing. You could. But if you're going to follow Jesus, there's going to be a cost. There will be a cost to following Jesus. It could be just a cost to your reputation because maybe your friends just aren't cool with Jesus. And if you really follow Jesus and you don't just stay in the closet, then, you know, you might not get invited to some parties. You might get a reputation that's different than a good one. Jesus might ask you to suffer for his behalf. He might expect you to get up early and pray for missionaries and the gospel and for people in need. And that might challenge your lifestyle. You go, but Lord, I'll be tired. Hmm. It costs something sometimes to follow Jesus. Are you willing to be tired? I'm not saying everybody has to get up early, but it is a common thing. Jesus did it. I don't have any time in my day to pray, Lord. Well, you should be praying. If Jesus prayed the Son of God, you should be praying. It should take something. It should cost you something. See, I'm going to tell you something. I'm saying that right now, and I feel the spiritual resistance in this room. I feel it. And I'm not even, I haven't even gotten the money yet. I haven't even gotten the criticism yet. I haven't gotten to all the things that we think are only for the super spiritual, highly committed people. No. Jesus is the life that we're called to. It's not a legalistic thing. It's like we should look at the life of Jesus and go, there's something beautiful about his life that I'm being invited into that's better than anything I could ever do. It's better than 2,000 hogs, which you know, was a lot of money. Whoever owned that herd was a person of substance, and it's not bad to be a person of substance. But what if Jesus says, I want you to take a significant amount of your substance and invest it in missions in Argentina? Because it'll be better for everybody, and even you, if you do that. If in your mind go, no, I just don't go there, you know? And you start rationalizing, that's one of those manipulative preachers that's always talking about money, right? I hear that from people, and sometimes I want to cuss. <laughs> Honest, I know you can't believe it, because I'm so holy. <laughs> but I hear people say that, and I go, Jesus gave his life for you, and you can't give up some money? You're not taking any of it with you. You realize that, right? The, you're not a pharaoh where all the gold goes in the pyramid with you, and then you die, and then all the robbers <laughs> take the money from the pyramid, and you wake up in the, in the future age, and you look around and go, man, I'm poor. What's the deal here? <laughs> it's not like that. Anyway, when the Lord comes he's going to come to the church again in a way that we're just starting to taste a little bit of right now. And our church and every community is going to have to stop and say, do we want what Jesus is bringing more than we want to be comfortable, more than we want to you know, be labeled whatever it is that makes us feel good about ourselves? Do we want to please Jesus more than we want to be pleased. It's really a question. We're, you may say, John, you're the gatekeeper. You're the one that determines that. I'm not. The people in this town were the ones that begged Jesus to leave. And Jesus said, okay, man, I'm packing. I've got stuff for you. You think this was cool. I helped this one guy, and you're all freaked out, but I have stuff for all of you. And they 
They wanted the pigs. They wanted what I, it doesn't say what they wanted. It was just a tragic thing. I've been living long enough to watch the Lord come to the church, knock on the door of the church, and from the other side of the door, you hear a muffled voice, go away. We don't want, we're not buying any. And the Spirit's been grieved. And, and do you think Jesus just, he, you know, he just gets a sledgehammer out, he starts breaking the door down? He goes, no, you're my image bearers. You have the significance of a choice. And I believe he keeps knocking. He just keeps knocking and keeps knocking. But like this shows, we have, to, we have to take this seriously and realize when the Lord draws, whether he draws near to a person or a family or a church or a community, Jesus will eventually walk away. He gives you that much significance. And I've wrestled, I've talked to a number of people about this passage for a couple of months and I've thought, I don't know how to share this in a way that I don't feel like, it, I don't want to condemn anybody. I, I want more to tell you the Lord's inviting us into something, right? Storms are coming. Storms are coming that will swamp our boat. We have problems like the demonized man. They're loose in our nation. They're loose in our communities. They're loose in our families. Jesus is not ignoring it. We think he's asleep in the boat. He doesn't know what, you know what is going on. He doesn't care. No. One of the things, he's waiting for us to step up to do the buck thing. You know, to do the thing like the young Chinese disciple who said, it ain't going to rain. Like Elijah said, it's not going to rain here until I say so. Wow, that is really cheeky. That's the legacy of the people of God because Jesus did that. You're, you're his body. There it is. It's that simple. You're his body. You do his stuff. And I don't mean we don't have to make our bones by presumptuously going out and saying, I, you know, I'm just going to stop the rain today. I just don't, I think it should be sunny today, right? That's not the spirit of this. But when the Lord says go, we've got to be willing to take that risk to step up and do that. And if there's some, something in you that matters more than the glory of the name of Jesus, you won't do that. You're not going to do that. You're not going to step up and do that. You're going to have a hundred reasons why you're not. And we're all going to stand before the Lord one day, and he's going to say, why didn't you do that? I had so many good things for you. They're amazing things. And we don't lose our salvation over that, but there's rewards and there's opportunities. And the cool thing is there's stories that just bring joy to your heart. And remember this. When you tell your story of being an image bearer of God, it sparks faith in other people. It energizes people. What God does in you when you tell your story, when you're just doing what he wants you to do, will spark awe in other people. Not awe at you, awe at him. That's what... That's what we're made for, to bring glory to his name. Now, I can bring awe to him by suffering, and sometimes that's what we're called to do. We will be called to suffer. It doesn't look like God's answering any miraculous prayers. The church went through it, watched him knee, died in the communist prison. But he had a life of victories also that testified to who is this, Right? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And they're going to, when, when we speak in his name and we live in his name and we love in his name and we give in his name and we pray in his name and we suffer in his name and we forgive in his name, it's going to spark awe in people. 
because other people aren't doing that. So we want to pray for a few people here before we leave. And I just want to ask you to, I, I, you know, I think there's faith here. If you, let's, let's, let's put it this way. When Zach told his story and then Shanna told an, you know, a, 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 an, an, an addendum to Zach's story, some of you felt like, wow, could God do that for me? Could God do that for me? Maybe only a couple of people, because you know, maybe only a couple of people have something that you know, you're struggling with. Whoever that is, just wherever you are, stand up. If, you, if Zach's story of pain leaving caused you to go, yeah, I want prayer. Uh, uh, Kim, go ahead. Anybody else, just stand where you are. Okay. Good, we're going to pray for you in just a second. Uh, some of you feel like that barrier I talked about, like the nature miracle barrier, is like you haven't hit it yet, but you know, yeah, I'm not, I can't do that. I don't even believe, I don't know if I believe Christians can do that, but you're willing to say to the Lord, Lord, if that is your will, I want to go there. I want you to lead me to that place. If that will bring you glory, even if it means I try something and it fails because I felt like I should try to do it for you, I'm willing to do that. If that's you, stand up wherever you are. Maybe it's easier if I say, all of us close our eyes so no one's looking around at you. We're going to talk about deliverance in the next few weeks. But Jesus is Lord of nature, and he's Lord of all of our enemies. All of our enemies. And some of us are, have been attacked and set upon by demonic spirits. They can affect our mental health, they can affect our finances. They can affect our relationships. They can affect our physical health. And not all mental illness is demonic, but there is demonic mental illness. Not all physical illness is demonic, but some physical illness is demonic. You get rid of the demon, and the pain goes. And, and it comes from us disobeying God. The enemy has an access into our lives, and, and he will prey on us if we say, I can do whatever I want, no matter whether or not God says it's okay. And in our sophisticated age, we have convinced ourselves that if I'm just sincere enough about my doubt that something that's kind of clear in the Bible and the church has believed for 2,000 years is not a good thing, but you know, if I can line up enough scholars behind me or friends, or friends and scholars, or at least someone on the internet somewhere, who will say that what I'm doing, even though the Bible says I shouldn't do it, is the will of God. I guarantee you, you will eventually get demonically oppressed in some way. It just happens. And maybe you already, you've, you've felt it. I had someone tell me recently, this has got to be demonic. If, if you feel like maybe you're experiencing some of that, the enemy's come at you and is beating you up, and you think, maybe it's because I've been kind of stubborn about something. Uh, I want you to stand up, and then we're going to pray. We'll just release it. But I know it's hard to admit it <laughs> when, I'm, when I painted the picture that way, but this is just about being humble, right? We're among friends here. Okay, so the people are standing up. I want to pray, and I just want to ask you, you guys know, we, we know how to do this. Just find people that are standing up, and have two or three people gather around and say, what can I pray for you about? And then just pray. Invite the Spirit to come, and don't feel like you have to immediately start saying anything. Wait, okay? Just wait. Let the Spirit begin to move on them before you pray prayers and then think nothing's happening. Wait for a minute, and let the Spirit come and start working. And it may happen immediately. And then uh, everybody else, if you have kids in the kids' ministry, please go get them. Because, uh, wow, I'm way past when I should have told you to do that. Uh, 
Okay, Father, we, we thank you for your word and your promises, and we just ask for the Holy Spirit to come and begin to move on everyone here, but particularly those that are standing. Lord, we pray that you'd touch kidneys and bodies here and backs and souls. We pray fire from heaven would come down like Elijah saw and it would consume the dross in our lives and it would fill us with your spirit and empower us. Lord, we pray that that barrier, that barrier from the enemy that says that We can't be children of God, that everything that Jesus has isn't really ours. Even though your word says that, it is ours. We're seated with him in the heavenly places. Lord, we pray that you would find among us a yes and amen to that promise that we are the children of God. And Lord, I pray, even for people that aren't standing right now, that you would just begin to wash their minds, wash their hearts of condemnation and accusation. Where the enemy has lied to you and says you've just done too much or you're just not enough or some kind of comparison where you fall short. In Jesus' name right now, we bless you and say let the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the washing and cleansing of the Holy Spirit be loosed in you that you will not live under that guilt anymore in Jesus' name. We, we say, let it begin to drain right now. And if you're standing, just hold your hands out. 